Well, Kyle? Yes, Kate. So, so, it's this guy again. He's, dude, go away. Just die already. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? This is as far as you go. Three times, apparently. Do you have any idea how many more interesting villains there are than you in this game? Yeah. She, over there doing your low rent, I went to the Walmart fabric section Hades cosplay. With your dumb hat that's not even for red mages, right? If you ever show up again, you better be because you're dropping a red mage hat. Nice. Oh, nice. We make notes before we get into these videos, Kyle. And I just have to ask, what does this note mean that says Fortuno apologizes for hating adventurers? Oh, yeah, they're at the docks. He, he stands up and he's like, and I must apologize to you, adventurer, for I blamed you for taking these twins away from us, for leading them off on crazy adventures. But now I see it was actually their fault. The forum in general has kind of an anti-adventurer vibe going on, which is fair. They're a bunch of academics, and they have the gleaners as, like, directly employed adventurers that they can send on exact jobs. So the idea of people gallivanting freelance style throughout the wilds is probably pretty scary to people in the ivory tower. Wait, so they like gleaners because they're adventurers that don't have a mind of their own? Exactly. Oh, okay. Controllable adventurers. Ah. Aaronville's a generous lover. Yeah, he is. His gleaners are just adventurers. Does everything on the docket. Adventurers that do what they're told. I mean, except for when he kind of told Fortuno to his face there on the docks that they were in on it too. But they were being overworked, so they had every right to breach contract. Fair. And then we get into a sea of unvoice acted cutscenes by Fortuno, which is a real shame because the man has such a fabulous voice now that he's chill. Plus, in Elden Ring was the first boss, you know, the one that's always going tarnished. That's him. Market? Thou art of passing skill. Warrior blood must truly run in thy veins. Tarnished. That's fortune, though. Yeah, he sounds badass in Damn. that game. And you can hear it, too, when he gets down on the level with the twins, and he's like, I swore to myself then and there that I would not let them steal your futures. It gets like a little tarnished for <laughs> a hot add moment. The reverb yeah, to it a little bit there. of that. Yeah, you know, he's not doing backflips with a big hammer, but but we do get into a sea of unvoice acted cutscenes for Fortuna, which is a bit of a shame because they're very important and they're laying out the entire spaceship business. It makes them seem like throwaway lines, but like this one here, miniaturized magics have been applied to the interior. Oh, so when we get inside the ship, it'll probably seem a little bigger than it is on the outside. So it's a TARDIS. Yeah. Let's get back to the Dorito. Okay. We finally get to the Dorito that looks nothing like the Dorito on the Endwalker logo. And I feel, uh, I, I really feel a class action lawsuit on false advertising is in order. Well, they're so tricky. What with the Gremlin back in the Shadowbringers, they just like being misleading, trickery going on. Coy. Dropping. And then in 
tandem dropping like huge truth bombs in the middle of trailers like the primals that played in the shadow bringers they're just all over the place they're trying to warp you mess with your mind whatever it is just trying to get in your business make you believe other things that aren't true and it works I, i believe that the spaceship is cooler on the logo really that flat thing the usb yeah. Flying through space. Dark, dark with like bright lit up glyphs and stuff as opposed to like white. The Normandy. It's like a, it's, it, it's, it's a lamer Normandy. Yeah, but it's kind of <laughs> enterprisey. It's, not, it's, it's cool kind of Normandy. Normandy. It's, it's a spaceship and I think it's a sleep. I do. I, honestly, after playing like Heaven's Warden goes going to as a slob, but particularly after the spaceship, I think it's just hilarious that anyone is like, this doesn't fit the aesthetic of Final Fantasy 14. I'm like, have you played Final Fantasy XIV? Have, have you have you played Final Fantasy XIV? Do we play the same game? Have you, you seen all of the Allegan tech? Have you seen all of the mock tech? Have you seen the ship in Endwalker? What do you... Huh? Is this guy talking to himself? Because you said the same thing about the car, and I did too. Oh, well, the, it's just the car is just a tie in to Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy 15. 14 has found an amazing way to do whatever the hell they want, and it's awesome. Their aesthetic is whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, all, it's all over the place. The only thing they don't have is like that vaguely steampunk look of Final Fantasy 7. Although I guess the goblins kind of have that a little you bit. You can dress up pretty steampunk too if you wish it. Oh yeah, yeah. B- different from like a seven aesthetic though. Like I'm saying, th- what's the main set? Midgard, Mid- Midgar. Oh yes, the Midgar. Yes, the Pump like, City. Like black and green steampunk. They can do it if they wanted to. Sure, I'd be not? down for it. Anyway, yeah, it made me. I've, I've been having a chuckle to myself ever since because I saw I saw the discourse, not on purpose. It's just I've I've liked enough Final Fantasy fourteen things on the Twitter site. I've I've liked enough things. I've liked enough Final Fantasy fourteen things on the Medion website that um it's now feeding the Medion app is feeding me a lot of Final Fantasy fourteen stuff, which sometimes gets me in trouble. Like showing me a gif of I think it's a Stinian doing push ups and I haven't seen that scene yet. I don't know when a Stinian does push ups. Lucky you. Have you seen the, the, the video that went viral? The lewd extinction. Ext- Astinian, yes. The lewd, the, the, the two balls. Like, I don't know who you are, dear artist, but you you brought me so much joy. That artwork is, it's just delightful. They know what the people want. <laughs> Before we get into the meat of today's MSQ discussion, uh, Kyle, we're, we're in the end game now. And walking. Listen. You know how the YouTube thing goes. We remind you to hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, all that kind of stuff. But now is definitely the time to remind you because our finale for Endwalker is right around the corner. If you're watching this the week it comes out, our finale is next week. This time next week, we will have seen credits on Endwalker. Rolling by. Rolling? And now I just think about Limp Bizkit. You think anyone in Limp Bizkit has played Final Fantasy XIV? I don't know. Maybe. It's hard to say. We subscribe to the channel and also go check out our Clips channel because, ooh, there's some bite-sized MSQ stream goodness over there. If you don't want to sit through like a five, six-hour VOD, subscribe. Subscribe. So what are you super excited about other than him confirming that they refer to the ethereal sea as the underworld? Yes, that was cool because I, I love the river sticks mythology, the whole don't drink from the river. You'll lose your memories bit. I love just got it. to a part like that in Sea of Stars. Death. Exactly. Cool guy. And that uh, always has the shop open for you in Hades. Yep. Another good game. Yep. Abhorson, perhaps a little more obscure, but really love the way the River of Death works there and has a sort of lore to it where people hang on to the edge and become more evil and corrupted as they do so. People don't want to be cast down the River of Death, it seems. And that applies here. So first up, we have at the heart of the star, the physical and ethereal are one and the same. Thus, the deeper we go, the easier it will become to pass between said planes. And he says, this is just like why we built the anti-tower. And we applied that same principle here. Awesome. Still want to hear more about, like, the Matoya rift, because it sounds really cute when she got pissed off at the forum and ran off with, I guess, the whole anti-tower in the deal. In the divorce, (laughs) she got to keep the anti-tower and all the frogs. He also says, but since the seventh umbral calamity, it has been rare to even hear a whisper. (laughs) Yeah, that's when she started stocking up the gas, but more on that later. Yep. Kryle agrees to stay behind and work the ocular lens, which 
I love the idea of telescopes pointing downwards into a hole. It's just fun. It's just cool. And they have the very kind of bendy, super mirrored idea going on. There is an ocular lens. And she's used to seeing the composition of our souls from spying on us for so long on the first and taking care of our friends. Genius. Yep. Great use of Kryle. Good payoff. Yep. There's a setup for this. It's wonderful. The so Kryle gets sidelined because there's a setup for Kryle getting sidelined. Now, I don't care about anybody else's interpretation of this because I'm countering myself here because I became confused. So this is for me. They go on to say, in the swirling depths, there are pockets of ether so dense and turbulent that they can unravel one's soul. In its embrace, his memories washed away, leaving only purity of one's soul, or so we believe. Some theorize that they linger for some time. Those associated with strong sentiment in particular. In those depths, memories of the departed may even coalesce around you for hatred or for love. This is really important. Because not everyone we're going to meet in here is necessarily a dead spirit. A large chunk of them are just memories. Which is why it's a-okay that Iceheart defends us from Amon when we get there. Yeah, it, this is a great place to kind of just get directly into the it scope because... I thought all of the souls that were kind of being pitted against each other were going to line up in a way that made sense to the story that we know as Final Fantasy XIV because it opens with Ilbert showing up and then Papal, I guess the memory of Papalimo manifesting through the head of Louis Swa's staff to defeat him. And also, like, what a, what a great sly way to just for the game and the narrative of the, ga- of the game to give Ilbert the middle finger because he's not even a boss. Not even a boss. Doesn't even have a purple wall. Door boss. Mini boss. He's, a bo- he's, the, he's, the, he's the bouncer before the boss. Yeah. He's the one seeing if he got cool enough clothes to even come in the club. Get wrecked, Ilbert. <laughs> Again. But yeah, that, that, that kind of, to me, that set it up that I was like, oh, and then I will probably see like a, a Thordan or the Knights and then Horsha Final Show. Nope. Nothing else yeah, matches li- up. Line it all up perfectly. Nothing else lines up. No, uh, but it is cute. On. Yeah. When you is. take them as memories, as this line has now made it clear. It is a profoundly cool dungeon with, for me, probably the least interesting dead people that could have brought back to be the bosses. Let's talk about that in a moment. First, I just want to compliment the elevator ding. It was unnecessary. Comic gold. Loved it. I mean, it really looks like it. I mean, it is It is an elevator. Yeah. You are descending between the planes to basically a small library level that they could maintain in an age. It was very anti-tower in that way. And Anti-Tower had that vibe. It's like Tower Terror up in that bitch. And they're studying. They're looking down, using these lenses, trying to find... They, they say whispers of Heidelin, so clearly there was some sort of voice that perhaps echoed up. But they were also looking for signs in the ethereal strands to tell the future. And the fact that they have all these oculars set up around with their little notepads. But the place is now overrun with monsters. We knew the place was going to be dangerous. We just didn't know why. Here's our answer. Real scientists went down there, got attacked by memories and spirits, and had to abandon it. Probably also we've been shoving a lot of spirits down there with all our exploits. I wonder if there's any side quests that explore that, because that was a thought I had. Is like, what happens if you're down here as, like, we kill a big bad? Like, what if you were down there when we we aced? Well, I guess the biggest bad that would have went through was Emmett, if my theory is right, and that's where Heidelin sent him, and he was probably pretty chill at that point because he got his memories back. So never mind. I was going to say Elidibus, but Elidibus died on the first. So he would have gone to the Ethereal Sea of the first. We are on the source, so do all things connect? We don't know that yet, and I'm not prepared to have that conversation. And I actually don't remember if Elidibus made any reference to him, like, fully dissipating the soul returning, or, is, or like, not a, like, it's completely gone, much like what we're going to talk about when we get to Vana. There's a difference between being so overloaded with ether and exploding, and possibly being entirely drained, like what happened to Elidibus, we don't know those particulars. And certainly, if we had met Ranjit down here, it would have made a strong stance about the lore and how things flow into the sorts. But they didn't. They basically stuck to a realm reborn when it comes to references. Outside of Ilbert. 
I mean, he has pretty he's strong definitely, ties yes. to Realm Reborn. He's definitely a part of a Realm Reborn. Yeah, yeah, which which is 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 one way to play it, right? Like, and, and you're not wrong. It's it, I think I personally would have preferred it. I'm not saying that this is how they should have done it. I'm just saying I would have liked it better if they kind of here's a boss from Realm Reborn, here's a boss from Heaven's Ward, here's a boss from Stormblood. That all took place on the first. We could have found one note each because three bosses, three expansions, basically. I get you. It is very a Realm Reborn heavy down there. And two shields. Like, why? He was upset he didn't get to fulfill the will of Gaius, and that left him feeling guilty. So yes. I think he was a guilty spirit. That's fair. And the game does a good job of, of making that make sense, particularly if you do... I can't believe I'm saying it. Particularly if you do the duty support, the thing I am not particularly passionate about, but... The scions were there. When you look up the uh, the additional dialogue you get when you bring in certain scions, that someone's like, no, Gaius wouldn't want this for you. Uh, I, now I want just a whole paragraph. Like, no, Ga- Gaius wouldn't want this for you. He saved his children from robots, except those that were juiced and died and became ghosts. Uh, but he's doing pretty cool, and he's got his own island. Like, just... <laughs> Just deliver. Just lay it all out for him. Yeah, it's very succinct. Well, he might just be a memory rather than a spirit. So we have Livia, the undeterred, our first boss yep. with long tentacles. We've seen this model before, but the tentacles do end in her little, gar- uh, you know, Warframe gun arm things, which is kind of cute. It's a nice touch. Undeterred, as it were. She's like your haunted crying spirit, crying over Gaius. Yeah. Yeah. Because she loved him so much and she never got to fulfill how ruthless she could be even though that's not really what he wanted in the first place that actually gives us i guess two bosses that are hung up on gaius out of the three yeah he i mean he was a force and he didn't die so it's not a forever dungeon there's going to be three bosses right like it would have been super cool to go through every single dead person maybe not like random soldier or even uh name day or something like that i'm okay not exploring name day further It would have been cool to meet everybody, but I'm also happy for Thordan because he's not lingering. He he moved on. He He was cast down the river. He was defeated. He stood there and said, if you can defeat me, then you deserve to stop me from having my beautiful world. I wish. And that was it. And he got defeated. Saw Sazassians. Yeah. Doubt. He drops the one F bomb a T for teen game is allowed to have. What? You that, you can't make a joke that lives and dies in post. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> Kyle's making jokes in post again. Stop this, man. I mean, we've, we've killed a lot of people. And they can't all be here. Our murder card is stacked. It's pretty full. Yeah. I don't feel very heroic when I think about it like that. We meet Moombrita. Well, Moombrita's axe. Yes, her axe appears. But, you know, Papa Limo's weapon. These are memories. We get a buff from Horsha font, which I thought was pretty cute. I wish they appeared. I wish it was, I wish. Well, Manphilia appeared. Sure. She did a little walk. Yeah, that's fair. That does make her land with more gusto and seem more important by comparison. Well, she kind of you know, was the word of the mother. She participated quite a bit in this ethereal sea. Word to your mother. And things start getting kind of icky and weird and dark. And you're wondering, oh, what dark realm reborn spirit awaits us over the hill? And who should it be but freaking Amon again? Yeah, yeah. I, I, this is minor for me, but like, I didn't need any of this. I was so done with Amon at this point. And what I truly, truly did not need was Asahi. I'm like, who <laughs> needed to see this asshole again? I like, loved it. Nothing about Asahi felt un, unfinished or incomplete. And he's the last character on earth I feel deserves any kind of revenge. Like, he's a piece of shit. I I don't care that he got to exude his revenge for Amon waltzing around in his body. I know I'm not alone in this. And I know many of you feel the same way. The Mummy was a formative movie for me with Brendan Fraser. Okay, I'm sorry. We're just looking at the camera and stating obvious shit now. Exactly. And the motif of someone being dragged to hell is awesome. And so I was more than okay with Asahi showing up and just dragging Amon down. He didn't actually do it. I think it would have been, you know, pretty expensive to actually animate old broken mouth Asahi. I, I'm so conflicted now because isn't that also like in a way a piece of Hermes soul and I feel bad for Hermes and I don't want Hermes to go to hell. Well, there you're getting into an interesting question of why it looked like Amon rather than Hermes. Well, because it's the soul of the reborn shard that was Amon who 
was elevated to the seat of Fan Daniel, who took the body of Asahi. If he would have looked like Hermes, that would have been a very interesting choice. But instead, we dealt with Amon here. Ending Amon's story, but not Hermes' story. I don't know. I feel I've really felt done with this character. I love his send off at the end of Zodiac. He's just sad. We know he's sad. It was established that he's sad. It's a tapestry. It's a tapestry of villainy. It's a tapestry of answers to the question. Maybe, maybe if it hadn't happened, there would have been some doubt in your mind about Amon actually being that Amon. But it was pretty clear when we saw it in the yeah. recording back in the patch content that Azizla Amon was Amon. Azizla is some sort of mental journey through the memories of time of rebuilding Elpis, as highlighted by Grahatia working the engine earlier in the labs part two. There has been plenty leading to this. I get why you see it's a retread, but to me, it was 100% a dialogue versus Xenos. And I'm talking about Xenos's speech when he was about to become Shinryu. So I ask you, why live at all? Man should fight for the joy of it. To live, to eat, to breed. Lesser beasts snap and howl at one another for this. Only man has the wisdom and the clarity to embrace violence for its own sake. Man wallows in a hell of his own making without purpose or meaning. For we who are born into this merciless, meaningless world, have but one candle of life to burn. Later on in this episode, when we talk about Heidelin telling everyone why you're so great, why how you found out to, to defeat despair, if she pointed to Xenos, she would tell him the reasons he yelled at the right before he said to hunt, Shinrio. to drink, to breed. Yeah, uh, all those. Your ending desire to hunt, to drink, to breed. Uh, it's really upsetting, but hey, you defeated despair, so good for you, I guess. Again, that's why I'm saying, and very poignantly, this is a tapestry of answers. We're about to listen to a song called Your Answers, which is <laughs> the reverse of the chorus now answering Heidelin's question as to why we live, right? Like, it's it's all poetry here, and Amon is an important piece of this. To live is to suffer. To live is to suffer. And in suffering, find strength and purpose and hope. I think Asahi is rightfully pissed. Because I would be pissed if someone stole my body and masquerade around. The part I'm nervous about is this line here. Don't try to follow me. I had more of you people than I could stomach in life. Never mind in death. Likewise, I pray we do not meet again. <laughs> you had better hope not. The shit, Asahi? What is this? Is this foreshadowing? I am. I will not be pleased if we do the Asahi revitalized I adventure. I never want to see him again. No! I will, this is the last character I want to see them pull out of a lexicon. Of course you can't stomach something. You got stabbed by your sister in the stomach. Be done! <laughs> well, be, it doesn't move, really matter once you're dead. Move on! Move on! Move on! Meaty on! Down the river you go! Just, 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 just go. go. Just go. It's fine. I'd just be pissed if someone he's stole my so, body. He's such a terrible person that I loved the last thing we saw of him. Him being murdered by his sister who he was so cruel to. Instead, Asahi's getting the last word here and I and that has that does not sit with me well. I found it pretty in a way. Because you know who didn't show up in this? Yatsuyu. She's a piece. Yeah. She ain't hunting nobody. Yeah. I just I was way more satisfied watching Asahi get murdered be the last time I saw Asahi. <laughs> Yeah, baby! That's what I've been waiting for! Well, other than being paraded around in the body by Fan Daniel, but he felt like a different character at that point. I thought me. it was cute that he was like, and how dare you make me do things versus Lord Zenos, who I love so, so much? I would never do things to hurt little Lord Zenos. Well, let's get to the eight part. You had a heart all along, Tin Man. <laughs> you can reduce it down to that, yes. 
I found it pretty. Let let let's yeah let let's get to the death of a character I only just started to think of as a character and not a deity, even though they are now shown again as a deity. Joanna Roth played what is essentially the tank, the shield maiden in Dragon Age Two, and did such a phenomenal job. There's a super cute quest in there where you help her fall in love with her boyfriend. So this route's pretty quiet. Yes, and it's. A real nice night for an evening. Um, <laughs> as you say, Captain. <laughs> yes, as I say. She's voicing Heidel in here and just destroying it. It is amazing. She has that weight of the battle maiden. I would hear thy response, warrior of light. Shouldst thou emerge victorious. I think they walk the line perfectly of the weight of those line deliveries feeling like they simultaneously could be coming from a deity or a person. That is, I think, how they were trying to have you look at Heidelin after having met and spent time with Vana. Or I'm projecting because that's how it hit me. Not only did I not trust Heidelin throughout most of my play of Final Fantasy XIV, but I... I also don't tend to get attached to, like, omnipotent beings in fiction. They're just impossible to relate to. To me, they're only fun if they're fallible. Right. Which is why I like Greek and Roman mythology. Yeah, and I guess in a way they are. So you, you're, you're, your mileage probably worked a little better <laughs> with uh, with Eidolon. But when we went and spent time with Vanilla and the whole Elpis section, I mean, so much of Elpis worked for me, but one of the big standouts was like, oh, boy, not only do I actually, I trust Eidolon now, I actually feel for and care for this character. And so so for me that this 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 hit this had a lot of weight cuz in short order this game made me care about this character and then took her away. And it's it's a it's a really heroic and I think a really classy end. Like it, I'm sure for a lot of folks it's sad, but for me I'm like what a what a class act, what a way to exit the party. But your character knew there's a lingering stare that happens at the very final moment before yeah, trial unlocked. I didn't read into that. You, you, you clearly did. Where you're both locking eyes and she's like, hey, defeat me and I'll let you go to the edge of the universe. And you kind of are like, defeat you? And she's like, yeah, defeat me. And you're like, really defeat you? And she's like, oh yeah, like really defeat me. To me, it felt like she was putting a lot of weight on the, the test aspect of it. I started to be lulled into this uh, clearly false sense of security that this character will be around forever, you know, which kind of makes sense, especially if we're like a reflection, like I know it's coming to an end and that Dawn Trail is the start of a new journey, but we're still going to be the warrior of light. And so to me, it like I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, I know they're not going to stop making the game. So it would make sense for Heidelin or Vanad to still exist in, in some aspect, but that's not the story they're here to tell. She doesn't exist. She doesn't have a place in the new world. And that's a classic yeah. writing trope. And it's, she's not precious about it at all. Like she yeah. could have left the crystal behind as a beacon. And she's like, no, sh cram that thing in the fuel tank and ride my collection to the baddie. She puts on her hero voice in that moment. It's not a God voice. What I love about Vana, the Vana we know and that we've related to on this channel, is a hero and seeded an adventure along the way. All of it, I think, is what makes it relatable. But this, like, I just don't relate to gods and I just I find them uninteresting and just oh so overdone at this point and none of this felt trite or tropey or played out or stale. Like this felt really unique. I think what's so relatable about it is, and you started to touch on it, she, she never makes it about herself. It's about everyone else in that room. And there's like one line of her realizing her own tragedy because she talks about how not even my soul will remain. But it's a blink and you miss it. It's one sentence where she's like looking inward and that's it. And she only says it to make the line that follows, which is, as I will always love you, my children make it real like what she's saying to the others feel even more important and land with more weight it's all earned and it 
it, along with this long journey and dialogue we've had in Final Fantasy XIV of parenting, not only just the Fortuno moment, but all the other moments that come before that, including Atsuyu, yeah. the Mother Crystal saying she's proud of us after she created us in the great hop on pop moment is beautiful. Never stop referring to it as that. And that is why she's not needed anymore because we have succeeded in going beyond what she was capable of. She can't go to the edge of the universe and fight Medion. She needs us to do it, and we're now strong enough. But getting back to the tapestry, your Wizard of Oz reference is perfect, but it is beautiful. That's great. And all the myriad of reasons to live. This is not bad advice for anyone. It's great advice. Of the eight reasons that are given to the eight scions, including the Warrior of Light, that are in attendance to this meeting, to this to this trial... Which, congratulations, you got me, everybody. You should run the support duty for this. There's a reason they let you bring the, the fill out the other seven slots with the Scions of the Seventh Dawn. Eight of the Scions, basically. The Warrior Light, I would say, is a little bit... It's, it's a little general. It's just like, you didn't abandon hope. Good for you. <laughs> but everyone else is, like, very specific. Because the Warrior Light needs to be kind of general because it's your insert as a When you were in those player. patch contents of A Realm Reborn, you didn't quit. Nice job getting here. Thanks for continuing yeah. to play. <laughs> Thank you for playing my game. <laughs> I I really like Yishtolas. I'm surprised how much I like Yishtolas. I think Yishtolas is my favorite. Because I don't consider myself an intelligent person. <laughs> i don't consider myself a learned man Mm -hmm. um like i don't i'm not into history books but i like learning new things i also love you sholas i I think it's my favorite because a lot of them are grandiose like grahas like his reason for living is that he saved the freaking universe oh yeah that is a a deeply like who's gonna relate to that the like a, a leader of a country that led them through some serious strife is about it. Honestly, that line makes Graha an even cooler character for me because Graha is so human and so relatable despite having gone through wildly unrelatable trials. The, the last thing I wanted to say is I love that there's a, a like kind of a bond between the Uriange and the Thancred reasons that are given by... Heidelin. They're, they're both about not being able to be with the ones that you love. But one is separated by death and the other is separated by essentially a physical barrier, albeit maybe metaphysical with Thancred and his distance from Reen. Because they're two characters that have a bond that are very close to each other within the constructs of this game and this narrative, but but also their reasons for living are pretty similar. Or you have Asinian who left behind the powers of hate. And found yeah. love for life. And these are all, it's snap, snap, snap. It's almost like you just want it to slow down and really do each character as their own trial. Because these are such important statements you have. And then you have a wacky, to kill me, the mechanics will be cool moment. <laughs> and the mechanics are cool. And they parallel when you had the trial with her by being more extreme versions of the dancing. Wave of light. A little insensitive there, Heidelin. Maybe shouldn't use the wave of light as an attack after you <laughs> almost destroyed an entire world with it. But Raha in the corner having PTSD. Yeah, right. Poor guy. Well, I guess he actually he showed up after the wave, but yeah, because Mephilia stopped the wave. He arrived after. I think he was still probably nervous about the wave at times. Probably reading about just it. And like, stuff. God, is this ever just going to unpause? It's yeah. going to suck. But it sticks the Heidelin landing where there's still landings to stick, but Heidelin's landing is, I consider it stuck. It's, it's, it's very well done. I would kind of bucket what we just talked about and the kind of the, uh, that's like just the soul of everything that just went down, but there's a whole other bucket. That's just like lore splainer of everything that goes down when we defeat Heidelin. Setup. Yeah, but also explanation. So like as Heidelin's, saying her final words, like one of the first things she opens up with is, though my power is in constant flux, I have always kept a reserve for this very moment. And I was just like, thank you, game. I was curious why she was so quiet for so long. <laughs> Especially after we're on the moon and we go through the archives and it's like, oh, so much of her power was spent like keeping this prison going. I'm like, okay, well, we, de- we dealt with that. Hey, Heidelin, what's up, buddy? What you doing? Shouldn't you have more power left? 
I mean, she's also like, I actually don't know how a car would work in this situation if pumping the gas would help, but <laughs> she's going real easy on the engine because every last ounce of it is going in the fuel tank. I took that differently. She's the, being reserved. The, the crystal is its own thing, and she is her own other thing. What do primals do but eat ether to be alive and to use their powers? Uh, so you're saying she could have drawn from the mother Absolutely. crystal but chose not to? And that's why in A Realm Reborn, even, we had like the big stop the giant robot, get out of the robot Gaius moment versus La Habrea because she participated there. Yeah. And she knew she spent there from stories back on Elpis, but otherwise she was just eking out every little bit with as low fuel consumption as she could manage. She could save herself with that. She doesn't have to die, but she's giving us that so we can go. And like, it's just, it's, it's so, so, so selfless. That's a good point. I have nothing to respond to, but that is a good point. <laughs> it's a cool mirror. To it completes up. her character. Yes. And it ties all the way back to Rome born primal hunting in a way I really like. So Yishtola lays out one of her classic Yishtola explainers, but it doesn't get second guessed at any point. By sundering the world into 14 shards, the ether of all living beings too was divided. This reduction would in theory allow us to more easily interact with Dynamis. Having seen mankind brought to the very precipice of extinction, you wished for us to develop a means to overcome despair. You believed we had the potential and sundered all creation to see it fulfilled to deliver us to that swirling maelstrom of dynamis in which our foe hides and grant us the power to defeat her once and for all. Is this not true? It still dodges that omnipotent problem that you and I both have in these situations, because how did you know this? But in this case, Yishtola poses it, and it's nothing but a silent nod from Heidel in agreement, and then she goes on to say... That was a very cool bonus to what I had to do. But really, I had to seal away Zodiac by splitting him into four pieces. The fact that you came out the other side able to interact with Dynamis better was a happy accident. And boy, am I glad it happened. I also love this next bit because my brain started immediately running away with it. She, she's like, I have one final gift to give you. You still have the Crystal of Asm, yes? And I'm like, oh, man, new powers that we're going to carry into Dawn Trail. And she's like, bah, 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 bah. don't worry, yeah, yeah. it, it won't last forever. She's very like, clear. They cover their, they cover their narrative vases yep. in this section. <laughs> like, it's it's great. Like, so Hyling gives us a crystal containing the memory of Medeon's passing through the stars. And for a hot second, I'm like, wait, where did that come? I'm like, oh, no, yeah. and she shot the Memory crystals, device. they well, happen all the time. Vanoth too. shot the... The, yeah. the tracker, the Spider-Man. Yeah, you know. but she says memory. It's really, it's just data. Like, yep. just It's just data. We're going to get more Loperits, though, Kyle. So, Well, um, yeah, because they're all over Charlie and now, and they need to help us work the ship. Yeah, and... yeah. She said, give this to the Loperits, and I just I started hearing that music again. It'll be okay. It'll be short, and they have a purpose now, so they won't be no, that's, fooling that's around. That's the problem with the music. My whole problem with the music is it's short. Longer. Longer loop, please. And then ultimate narrative butt covering. As Hydaelyn, I reside over the forces of stasis, tranquility, peace. The laws which impart stability to existence itself. I will weave this self-same power into the crystal, granting thee mastery over matter, to give form to the formless. Use it wisely, or it will not last indefinitely. We're going to summon and give form to our dead buddies for the final fight. That's going to happen. I think that's how we bring Emmett and Hithlodeus back into this, because they're even getting hinted at in the bubble scene after all of this. Oh, sure. Which I don't have a ton to say other than I very much enjoyed that scene. Yeah, and the tech is already there, at least to us now in the future. When you experienced it, it would have been the past when this wasn't done yet, but we know that the support duties are done for Heaven's Ward now where they have an Ice Heart, a Fortuno, Emmett, Hithlodeus. Who else? It's going to be a trial, so we need more characters. Who else can join us in Papalimo? Because we're able to sum we're summoning Yassail. all the dead. Yassail. Yep. Yep, I already got her Ice oh, Heart. Okay. I call her Ice Heart. Hershefont, Yassail, Papalimo, uh, Emmett, Hithlodeus. Yep. We need, what, two more? Two more. 
Who else is Minfilia, I guess. Oh, Minfilia, yeah. yeah. That's a huge one. How do we forget her? Louis Wall? That'd be interesting. That would be interesting. Hmm. That would be a really yeah, big payoff for the 1.0 people. We don't think about it because we didn't play 1.0. But you think she's dead, dead, dead. Like, there wouldn't be a Vana ghost in that there's, trial. I don't think there's anything to pull. And it would betray the gravity of this scene. It would. The frog, the Matoya frog. Last one, Matoya frog. Matoya tank in the anti-tower. That, that's, this is how we're going to summon our dead friends. I, I like it. I think. And they've added enough excuse that this heck can happen once. Don't think about it too much. Just we've empowered this crystal. And, uh, and also now that we're in full, one of the final pieces of cooking we'll ever do, because we are standing on the precipice of finishing this game, as much as you can finish them in MMO, which, God, I'm already having thoughts of, like, what an accomplishment. that They actually, like, gave an ending to an MMO. Bold. But they're still going to keep the game going and just new, new arc. Let's go. It's... It, it, did you know that Final Fantasy XIV is a good game? You should play it. But as we're here at the end of our journey with Realm Reborn through, through Endwalker, I really truly believe that that's the only thing that can happen with that power being bestowed. It's That's what the Asm... When we first got the Asm Crystal, it's how we summoned... We canonically summoned warriors to our aid... Like it's it's just it's what that item does. It's how we it's how it's it's the it's the MacGuffin that explains canonical duty finder. This is an interesting line here about the forces of stasis, tranquility, and peace. What would be the purpose of that? Maybe we get to unmerge, do our own hop on pop on Medion since she congealed with her sisters and split them all into their individual bits. You could have the trope of us carrying the little baby, the good Medion, out of there, kind of moment. That's interesting. I figured it would, I, to me, it just reminded me of Shadowbringers and the stasis that comes with the power of the light that in Shadowbringers was utilized for evil. How does it land for you? To know Vanaz just gone. It works well with what we know of defeating Asians, that the white orosite is used to keep them still while we blast them, that Emmett was defeated, not because of the white orosite, but because he was blasted so thoroughly. So to me, this is a nice cleanup of what we were confused about. Don't you just get reborn? But no, she's been through so much ether. She was packed with ether to make herself as a primal in this first thing. Much like Louis Swab became Phoenix was an interesting, like, lower tier primalization that happened. And the fact that you can connect all those bits, it's clean. Well, man, um, the next video, while it may be two parts, will be post us finishing Endwalker. Have answers. Edge of the universe. Hope you walk with us to the end. And enjoyed the journey getting here. Yeah. <laughs> Mysterious fathoms below.